My baby put a smile with his man in there I give it too cold, she won't marry me I'm gonna see so I want a pepper man my next guest is fellow Own It writer and Murky Books author, Derek Owusu. Despite being an award-winning author and one of the best writers I've ever read, Derek's own educational journey was also quite difficult. Through various experiences and moments of change, Derek managed to build a love for reading. Books became his passion and escape through finding relatable black British storytellers and poets. This representation, which gave him a new scope of the world through books, made Derek who he is today. Welcome, Derek, bro. Derek Owusu, he is an amazing author and an amazing writer. And yeah, he's a champion of, champion of everything great, I would say, like in regards to black writers, in regards to black British male writers. and. Today, I just wanted to talk about like your your journey and how it kind of works its way back into reading literature and the work that you're doing now. Where is Derek Musu coming from? Where is where does like your journey begin? Like, who are you? Yeah, my journey is so you know it's a uh, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a troubled one. You know, obviously I was in, I was in foster care for, for about seven years. Um, and then and that was like outside London. I was in like a village. I was raised by, you know, white, white family out there. Mm. Then came back to London to, to Broadwater a farm um, in Tottenham with my mum. And yeah, I, I mean, I, I didn't like school. I didn't like school at all. I just yeah. thought I was stupid. I thought I felt like I was wasting my time there because I just felt like I didn't have any kind of intelligence to to get through. You know, that's why I didn't go to uni when I first finished secondary school because I was just like, I'm not going to be able to do it. I, I've got the brains to do it. You know. Mm. Um. So yeah, I was always getting into trouble and things like that. I mean, I feel like I'm lucky that I didn't get kicked out. You know, those I've been suspended a lot of times. Yeah. And it, it was, I was on the brink. I was on the brink. So in year six, after messing around from year three, year four, year five, about to get kicked out. And one teacher, I remember her name, Miss Harry. She said to me, she was like, you, you are smart. Like, you're not stupid. That was the first time I heard it. The latter mm. half of year six. So then I thought to myself, okay, so maybe I am smart. So I started, I just started doing the work. Doing I started doing things. the work and all of these kind of things. I started acting like I was smart. And then yeah. when we got to the SATS test, I remember I got four, 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 like I got all fours. And then Miss Harry came up to me and she was like, Derek, imagine if you applied yourself from the beginning, you would have got all fives. Mm. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> there usually is like, obviously you get it in like movies like, you know, Dangerous Minds and Freedom Writers. There's like, oh, that one teacher who believes in, <laughs> in, the, in the black students and helps <laughs> yeah. them. But that, that, that did happen to me, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so after I left primary school, I got to secondary school. I just, I went backwards again. I just, I just wasn't feeling it. Wasn't feeling the teachers or anything like that. You know, I wasn't reading in school and yeah. So I, I, I left, I left secondary school. I had no idea what I was going to do, you know, and then obviously I just started working. There are a lot of barriers, especially when you come from a particular um, background, you know, um, even family can be a barrier mm -hmm. to a certain extent, you know, um, especially you know when your mother's busy your mom's at work you get home from work your mom's not there there's food in the microwave you just got to heat up eat it then do you see what I'm saying and then you just you yeah. go out to play there's nobody to regulate you you just go out mm -hmm. as soon as you finish eating or whatever um, that's definitely a barrier to, to, to study um, and progressing in secondary school I say another barrier for me personally was just wanting to be liked and because I didn't believe I was smart or I was particularly gifted at anything, because some people in secondary school there, they managed to get their friends and being like through football. I mean, I hate football. Mm -hmm. That's one thing, you know, or through basketball, <laughs> you know, they yeah. play, play basketball they're on the basketball team or they're like the strongest in the school or they're just, you know, popular. They're good looking or this or that. For me, yeah. I could make people laugh and I'll do that in class rather than studying because I wanted to be liked. 
So I'm always just trying to make people laugh. The teacher will say something, I, I, you know, I'll bust a joke. Somebody, I, I, you know, I'm tapping my friends like, yo, get listen to this. While they're trying to study, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> do you know what I mean? They're yeah. trying to study and I'm trying to uh, bust joke with them. And even though they were laughing with me, like we're all cracking joke, when it came, for, came to results day, they were still studying while I was still making jokes. And so they got mm-hmm. good grades. And I was kind of like, again, that just reinforced. I thought, they were having a laugh with me. They've got good grades. I was having a laugh. I've got bad grades. I'm clearly just stupid. It wasn't that. They were studying too. You know? Yeah. They, were, they, were, they were getting the best of both worlds. I even remember that transition for me from primary school. Because in primary school, I was like one of the bad boys. But I wasn't like an evil guy. I wasn't joining a gang or, or mm. like doing madness on a block or anything like that. I was just like a bad you. Like I was very naughty. And... Also, I was mad strong as well. Mm-hmm. To get to secondary school, there was that whole thing of back in, I think, I feel like yeah. now, yeah, now it's like who's got the most peas, who's the most popular. But back then, it was like who's the baddest, who's the strongest. Who's the strongest? <laughs> like, so yeah, yeah. it was such a, a powerful imperative to me. I even remember there'll be sometimes I'll be at home, I'm doing push ups. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I need to get stronger. I'll get excluded. I'll come back yeah, yeah. and my chest is a bit more firm, and I'm just, mm-hmm. and everyone's like, oh, Jude looks hench, you've got a haircut as well. And I'm just there, like, mad <laughs> gas. And yeah, fam. So none of that matters now, but it is what it is. That's life at that point in time. Exactly. When do you think things change for the worst in your life, and they also eventually change for the better? I think change, things changed for the worst in my life. Probably when I was about 11. And I think that's when it became clear that I had depression. Obviously, I didn't know that. I think a lot of kids, you know, suffer with depression. They don't know what they're going through. They just feel randomly sad or mm-hmm. they become fixated on death or they become, you know, they just, they just don't feel good within themselves. Do you see what I mean? I wouldn't go to some of my most of my lessons I'll just sit in the sixth form in one of the corners with my knees up and my head in my arms mm-hmm. and just I, I couldn't move from that position I just stayed there and people would just come up to me you're right Derek and I'll just be like yeah I'm fine you know and I just I didn't know what was wrong with me I just thought oh, I'm mm-hmm. just I'm just I'm a sad person or whatever but it's more than that yeah I think things changed for the better in university that's when I went to my GP and I said that I think there's something wrong with me that was then that mm-hmm. was when I was in uni also because that's when I discovered literature. That's when I discovered books and reading. You know, again, it was just another person in my life who, who just changed things for me. You know, one of my research methods lecturers, because I was studying exercise science at the time, obviously coming from a personal training background. Mm-hmm. And he basically challenged us. He said, look, you're going to be reading a lot of research papers in order to get into that kind of mode of reading a lot go to the library and read some classics, you know, read some Mm -hmm. Charles Dickens or whatever, you know. I only knew who Charles Dickens was from the Muppets Christmas Carol movie, do you know what I mean? (laughs) I never (laughs) picked up any of these books really glad. The only way I knew the name. So I went down to the library, looked at his books. His books were fat. I was like, I can't get through all of this. Um, And for some reason, I don't know why, but the name D.H. Lawrence was in my head. Obviously, I'd never come across D.H. Lawrence, but for some reason, I don't know where I'd heard it, maybe like some pop culture reference or something, I don't know. Mm. So I picked up a book of his short stories, read the first short story, and bam, everything changed. Everything changed after I read that first short story. I was just like, whoa, like, this is what it's like to read. Mm. You know, I was, I was upset that I was like, damn, I can't believe I'm only discovering this now. Mm-hmm. But I was also thinking maybe this was when I was supposed to discover it then. You know, the, the short story I read from D.H. Lawrence is about a wild horse in uh, a, Welsh, a Welsh horse. Well, that's got nothing to do with me. But the writing, how immersive it was, you know, what he's speaking about, the way he used language and the form, it just really blew my mind. It just opened up something for me. And after that, I just became obsessed with reading. I just started mm-hmm. going through all the classics, you know, Oscar Wilde, H.G. Wells, E.M. Forster, you know, I started going yeah. through all of them. If there was a day where I hadn't read something, at least 50 pages of a book, 
I would be physically uncomfortable. Like, I, it, it was like an obsession of mine. I just had to read, you know. Mm-hmm. And I guarantee if I wasn't reading all of these books um, without knowing their classics, because I wasn't reading like I was working. I was reading like I'm enjoying this. I'm having fun doing this. I was reading for pleasure. I think it was important that I came in in that way because of my relationship to education. It was important I came in through the pleasurable route. I, was, I came from that era when reading was totally uncool. I think yeah, yeah. for a majority for us, yeah, that's how it was. So again, like the fact that you said that, right, at age 11, you were depressed. You didn't, you didn't necessarily know why. And in the same fashion, I felt like during that period when I was kicked out of school, that's when I noticed that was something kind of hovering over me. It's something that mm. I couldn't entirely explain or dive into. And it affected my education and output severely. And second year of university, a friend told me to go to the GP, get myself checked, ran some tests. They said that, Rob, well, you're suffering from like severe depression. And the way I came to terms with that was, again, through reading. I had to read my way kind of out of that, understand what depression was, understand how my mental health is a thing in itself and I need to address it in the same way I was doing, like going to the gym and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And it really left an impression on me because I considered the fact that I've probably been depressed for a mad long time, probably since primary school as well. But from where we're coming from, that's not necessarily a thing we dive into, kind of until it's too late. And I always yeah. just think like, right, there's so many students that are going through something mentally that they, they won't have the time or the access or opportunity to address. Through your talks and stuff, you've inspired me to pick up books and read it from a point of enjoyment. Yeah, so my last last question would just be advice in regards to reading now i'm probably even going to take this on board myself as well because i'm one of them very fragmented (laughs) readers i used to see it as like okay there's 300 pages of this book right if i read um 15 pages a day i'll be done in 20 days like that's how i used to see i used to try and um break it down i hope the maths is correct but <laughs> you know what I mean? I tried to break it down in a way where, yeah, I've tried to make it a process. And that stems from the academic kind of reading. I had to do that when I was reading those deep philosophical texts and it was like, yeah. well, to get the main point, break it down. But yeah, to read from a point of interest, like how did you start? Like what techniques did you use to like kind of immerse yourself? Or was it a thing where, you were just kind of sold completely to the process. Yeah, at the the beginning, it was like that. I was just devouring books and just being lost in them. Obviously, life happens and get a job and that. So one one thing that did definitely help me is that I just set myself goals. I'll say, okay, this book is 300 pages. I'll read 25 pages in the morning, 25 pages in the evening. That's Mm -hmm. 50 pages a day. I can finish this book in a week. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That 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 helped me a lot. Just trying to get through the books, but also I also I got to a point where I was kind of like, you know what? If I'm not enjoying this book, I'll just put it down and onto the next one. There's no pressure to finish a book yeah. just because you started it. I think that gets a lot of people down because then they're just not enjoying it. They're like, this is a struggle, and then yeah. they're off put. By the time they finish the book, they're like, oh, I'm happy I finished it. I can't be bothered to read another one yet. Yeah. If you're not enjoying the book put it down just use the 50 page rule once you get to 50 pages if there's nothing in there that you've that's piqued your interest or you're enjoying put it down trust me there's plenty more books <laughs> plenty more books <laughs> yeah, you know no, for real. For just, real. Just, just pick up something else but also when you read go into the book with an open mind mm-hmm. an, op- an absolutely open mind do not expect anything from the book before you've read it when you yeah. expect you're usually disappointed you know, yeah. you have no idea what you're going to get most of the time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so those those are like probably the three best tips. I fully hear you. And I'm going to take on board the, the morning and night. The 25 pages, usually when I've tried to break it down like that, I've tried to do 25 pages in a day. But that's mm-hmm. when it, the book drags. Like, and I've 
no, right, starting right. to learn is when you get to like that page 50, you get to like page 100 and you're in the thick of the story, that's when I don't want to put it down. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Literally, yeah. so yeah, I fully hear you on that, man. But yeah, bro, Derek, you gave me gems today. Like, words of I wisdom. I love, man. Good talking, bro. Good talking. I love, love it. Thank you yeah. so much, my bro. Cheers, my bro. Love. Thanks for watching Game Changers True Stories. If you'd like to read more, you can download a free text on the National Literacy Trust website. If you have any questions, please comment and I'll try to get back to you.